Greetings, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is David Bob. I am director of the Kirby Center at Hillsdale College. We're pleased that you're joining us here on uh, Capitol Hill and across the country via webcast. Today, we're uh, pleased to, to, to feature a, a most important topic taught by one of the foremost experts on the matter of religious freedom. Blasphemy and free speech is the title of Paul Marshall's remarks, and we're pleased that you've joined us to consider this uh, most uh, relevant and, and timely topic. We'll have time for questions, uh, both in person and those of you who are uh, from around the country uh, uh, shortly after uh, the prepared remarks this morning. I'll have some announcements at the end of our uh, time together today, and I think for those of you who are regular attendees of this First Principles on First Friday's lecture series, you know that lunch follows the forum. So we'll ask, uh, invite you all to, to, to join again uh, today in that. To offer a formal introduction of our speaker is Hillsdale College senior Emily Reagan. Emily, a politics major, is interning at the Heritage Foundation this term. Emily, please. Thank you, Dr. Bob. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Paul Marshall is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute Center for Religious Freedom. He's written for the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and is the author or editor of more than 20 books on religion and politics, including Their Blood Cries Out, Blind Spot When Journalists Don't Get Religion, and most recently, Silence, How Apostasy and Blasphemy Codes Are Choking Freedom Worldwide. Today, he will be discussing the important top topic, blasphemy and free speech. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Paul Marshall. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you very much to Hillsdale for um, having me here. I've long been a, uh, a fan of Hillsdale College, of having been out to Michigan. I once spoke on a program with the Dalai, Yom, Dalai Lama's younger brother, uh, who gave insights about, not in, in public, but in, over coffee, insights about the Dalai Lama you wouldn't get anywhere else, except, you know, nobody's a hero to his younger brother. <laughs> so, but uh, it's, it's very good to be here. I, I, uh, my topic is blasphemy and free speech, and there are many aspects to this, but I'm going to focus on the question of, of blasphemy within the context of Islam, which is 99% of the cases we're dealing with worldwide right now. Um, I'm going to use the term blasphemy, occasionally apostasy, occasionally insulting religion. Um, that's shorthand for a whole family of terms. Um, if you try to look at blasphemy laws worldwide, um, it often wouldn't reveal much because the various offenses can be described as defamation of Islam, causing confusion to Muslims, uh, creating anxiety amongst the leaders of the Islamic Republic. That is an offense in um, Iran. It would be a virtue in the United States. Um, uh, warring against God, friendship with the enemies of God, deviating from true religion, insulting a heaven re religion. There are very many of these, and many are not listed in statute. It is this family of restrictions that I, I am interested in. And for shorthand, I'm going to refer to this as, as blasphemy in the context of Islam, in the Muslim-majority world and also in the West. Twenty years ago, it would probably have seemed strange to pick a topic such as this. Um, there are blasphemy laws uh, still on the books in the West, but mostly they're defunct. At the federal level, the United States has never had a blasphemy law. And so it would seem to many an archaic subject. That changed 20 years ago. In 1989, the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran, the uh, late Ayatollah Khomeini, um, issued a fatwa which declared that a book, a novel, The Satanic Verses, by um, a British-based Indian origin author, Salman Rushdie, uh, was blasphemous. And therefore, it was the duty of every Muslim to kill Rushdie and others involved in that book. 
As you would know, Rushdie is still alive, uh, but he has had to live a protected and hidden life ever since. Others have not been so fortunate. The novel's Japanese translator was assassinated. Its Italian translator was stabbed. Its Norwegian publisher was shot. 35 guests at a Turkish hotel hosting its, its Turkish publisher were burned to death in an, um, an arson attack. Several hundreds of people died as a result of that. This decree by Khomeini inaugurated the export of blasphemy rules to the West, that is, seeking to hold people in the West, including the United States, also subject to those types of restrictions. So what I will do is review much of what is, is happening in the Muslim world, and then the attempted export of these to the West. But uh, since Khomeini's edict, the 21st century has, uh, has witnessed repeated eruptions of violence worldwide. For example, in regard to Theo van Gogh and uh, Ayan Hersi Ali's feminist film, Submission, uh, Theo van Gogh was, of course, killed on a street in Amsterdam. His killer was attempting to behead him when uh, he was apprehended. You had the famous Danish cartoons in Yale and Posten, the Swedish cartoons, uh, Pope Benedict's Regensburg speech on reason and violence in religion, which, produced an, which resulted in an eruption of violence. Geert Wilder's film, Fitna, the false Newsweek story that the US military desecrated Korans. Uh, such matters are in the news every, now every week, uh, pretty well every day. Um, some events, such as the declaration by Terry Jones, a deservedly obscure Florida pastor with a congregation of less than 50, his declaration that he would burn a Koran during prime time on September the 11th, 2010, achieved a perfect media storm. It combined Muslim outrage at the desecration of the Koran with American public publicity seeking and also the demands of a 24-hour news coverage. Um, this claim, which he did not carry out at that point, uh, drew in the military command of the U.S. forces um, in Afghanistan, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, and the President of the United States, all for a man who simply said he was going to burn a Koran. Why has this become such an issue for us? Well. One reason these issues have grown the way they do is that there is deliberate manipulation of these sentiments by many governments around the world. Okay. The campaigns about insulting Islam are not often about callous cartoonists or provocative pastors, um, but in, in reaction to particular policy goals of governments which take a very real resentment and stoke it. For example, the famous Danish cartoons of Mohammed were published in Denmark's largest newspaper, Yale and Posten, in September 2005. What erupted when they came out? Nothing. There were peaceful demonstrations by Muslims in Denmark complaining about this, which they have every right to do so. Um, but in December of that year, the Organization of um, Islamic Conference, now called the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, held its meeting in, in Mecca and uh, changed its agenda to discuss the cartoons. And uh, governments sought to call attention to them. Um, that was December. That was three months later. Um, the violence erupted in February 2006, five months after the caricatures were published. Saudi Arabia and Egypt, perhaps irritated by the then US policy of pushing for democracy in the Middle East, urged boycotts of Danish products. Iran and Syria manipulated riots, partly to defect, deflect attention from their nuclear projects. Uh, Denmark was due, in fact, to chair the UN uh, Nuclear Disarmament uh, Committee um, beginning that April. Turkey later used the cartoons as bargaining chips in negotiations with the US, including in person with President Obama, to gain leverage for two high-level Turkish appointments to NATO. So there are many. Um, how is it that 98% of Egyptians and 99% of Syrians knew about these cartoons? The press is controlled there. People who could not find Denmark on a map 
knew all about, or thought they knew all about these, these cartoons. In contrast, uh, you probably have not heard of Lars Vilk's Swedish cartoons, which, unlike the Danish ones, are sort of meant to be offensive. Uh, when Vilks uh, published those, again, what happened? Almost nothing. Uh, there are still repeated attempts to assassinate him, but no government made a fuss about it. And then when Terry Jones actually did burn a Koran, do you know that he did so several months ago? What happened then? Almost nothing. I think our media helped. They realized that giving great coverage to this um, increases the chance it's going to happen. But we have a situation that, that, that some situations erupt, others which one would expect to cause far more reaction do not. Hence, one of the first points I want to make is that campaigns against insults to Islam are not simply eruptions of outraged religious feeling. They also reflect governmental manipulation. Now, I don't mean that there is no religious feeling that Muslims are not upset when people uh, burn a Koran. Uh, the sentiment would be similar if someone uh, desecrated uh, a host uh, uh, for, for a Catholic mass. The sentiment is, is very real, but it is channeled. And again, you can only channel religious resentment or religious outrage if it already exists. So the outrage is real but it is subject to manipulation, and we need to be aware of that. Who tend to be the targets of um, such accusations? I've so far talked about uh, things in the West, but most of the targets are in the Muslim world. As Nina Shea and I show in uh, our recent book, um, Silenced on Apostasy and Blasphemy Codes, such accusations are now used systematically in much of the Muslim world to quash religious minorities. Uh, but also, Muslim authors, journalists, democracy activists, including the region's Nobel Prize winners. The victims also includes, include religious reformers who may be jailed or killed by vigilantes or terrorists for insulting Islam or mocking religion. Amongst religious minorities, currently millions of Baha'is and Ahmadis followers of religions or interpretations that arose after Islam are condemned en masse as de facto insulters of Islam and are subject to brutal and discriminatory laws, pervasive state and extra legal violence, and attacks by terrorists and vigilantes. The, the leadership of Iran's 300,000 strong Baha'i community are currently all in prison and in, in, since Baha'is uh, are not recognized in Iran, they have no legal status, which means there's no penalty in that country for killing a Baha'i. They are literally outside the law. Um, Ahmadis, of whom there are several million in Pakistan and, and millions elsewhere, suffer similar treatment. In fact, if you go to the website of the Pakistani embassy in Washington, D.C., and go to the forms which you need to fill out uh, to get a passport, and you will come to the requisite page when you must denounce the Ahmadis and affirm that they are not Muslims. They're, they're called Qadianis. Though you only have to do this if you're a Muslim. If you're a Christian Pakistani or a Hindu Pakistani, you, you don't actually have to denounce them. But it is a condition for getting a passport that you condemn the Ahmadis, a Pakistani passport that you condemn the Ahmadis. Those who leave Islam for another religion, or none, face similar fates. Uh, most strikingly, in Somalia, the Al-Shabaab militias are systematically hunting down and killing every Christian in the country, on the grounds that all Somalis used to be Muslims, therefore, if one is a Christian, they have left Islam, they are an apostate, and the death penalty applies. Uh, this situation is not covered in our media, but... Um, it is a campaign to literally exterminate Christianity in those areas. Um, in mob violence, for example, in 2009, after allegations in Pakistan that a Quran had been torn, a 1,000 strong mob rampaged through Christian neighborhoods in Punjab, uh, killing seven people, burning them alive. That included two children. The police were there but did not intervene. 
or amongst uh, Muslims. Uh, Sunnis, Shia, Sufis may also be persecuted if they are in an area dominated by another branch of Islam. Iran uh, represses Sunnis and Sufis. Saudi Arabia represses Shiites, as does Egypt, where you can be imprisoned for being under the influence of Shia ideas. But one major target on which I want to focus uh, relatively more attention is Muslim reformers. That is, uh, people who by and large um, are interested in religious freedom, in political freedom, in freedom of speech, and many other things, these are often the victims of repression. That accusations of blasphemy are used by repressive regimes and movements to silence the more liberal, by liberal I mean committed to freedom, the more liberal counterparts. Uh, so, for example, in Afghanistan, Ali Mohakak Nasab, the editor of Women's Rights magazine, uh, was imprisoned by the Karzai government for publishing un-Islamic articles that criticized the idea, it basically asked, does Islam really require us to stone adulterers, or at least female adulterers? Does it require us to kill people who leave Islam? Um, for that, he was sentenced to prison. In Saudi Arabia, democracy activists have been imprisoned for using what the charge called un-Islamic terminology, such as democracy and human rights. Or Muhammad Yunus Sheikh, a member of Paki was a member of Pakistan's Human Rights Commission, when he raised questions about Pakistan's policy in Kashmir, he was charged the following day with having blasphemed in class. In Bangladesh, Salahuddin Chowdhury was imprisoned for hurting religious feelings because he advocated peaceful relations between Bangladesh and Israel. In Iran, Ayatollah Borajerdi was imprisoned for arguing that political leadership by clergy was contrary to Islam, which, by the way, is the traditional Shia position. Khomeini was the unusual one. Or again in Iran, there, there are many dissident Ayatollahs, several of whom have been imprisoned. Uh, Mohsen Kadavar was imprisoned after he wrote a dense three-volume Theories of the State in Shiite Jurisprudence, which book argued that the late Ayatollah Khomeini's teaching of the guardianship of the jurist was contrary to Shiite legal theory, which would be the view of most traditional Shiite scholars. So he's put in prison. Why? For deviating from true Islam. This man is a pious Muslim. This is a dense traditional work in Shiite jurisprudence. But it went against the policy of the regime. So he is put there. Uh, still continuing on the repression of Muslims under these laws, these threats even exist or do exist against Muslims in the West. In 2006, an organization which called itself the Supporters of God's Messenger emailed 30 Muslim reformers uh, living in the West, several of them friends of mine, said it would kill, said they were apostate because of uh, their views and it would kill them unless they repented. The, those who received these included the Egyptian Sadadeen Ibrahim, perhaps the best known human rights activist in the Arab world, who's been teaching in the United States, uh, Ahmed Mansour, who was, had been imprisoned in Egypt for arguing against the death penalty for apostasy. These messages included their addresses and the names of their children, so they were taken seriously. So these are Muslim reformers living in the United States. Or in Europe, Mimun Buslaka, a Belgian senator, a Muslim Belgian senator, was forced into hiding after threats to ritually slaughter her because of her criticism of the status of women in Belgian Muslim communities. Ikin Delagos, the first Muslim member of parliament in, in, in Germany, received death threats and, and lives under police protection after she called for Muslim women to take off the headscarf. So these threats also extend against Muslims in the West. We could give many more examples. And then there is the effort led by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, to export these laws. And they've sought to do so through the UN for over 20 years. Uh, calling for international law to ban insulting Islam or insulting religion, and then pressuring Western governments 
to repress their own citizens when they say something which is understood to be insulting to Islam by somebody. So, and many Western governments have in fact caved in the face of this or resurrected their own hate speech laws. So in Austria, um, late last year, Elizabeth Sabadich Wolf was convicted of denigrating religious beliefs for her comments about Muhammad. These were not even sort of quote hate speech comments about Muslims, but it was in fact a theological point she made. She has been fined in Austria. She said she will not pay and they can imprison her. Or something, a, let me discuss, a, someone who's currently a visiting faculty member at Hillsdale College this year, Mark Stein. Canada's grossly misnamed human rights commissions uh, int have interrogated writers, including Mark Stein, about their writings on Islam. In Europe, popular politicians such as Geert Wilders or Jossi Halle Allo in Finland have been prosecuted for their comments in political speeches on Islam. These are two of the most popular politicians in their respective countries, and these were political speeches. And then the prosecutor comes calling. If we turn to the United States, in America, the First Amendment still protects us from criminalizing criticism of things Islamic. And despite the vagaries of our courts in other areas, um, they do tend to hold up on this matter. But in the United States, we still face at least two dangers. One is extra outside intimidation outside of the law. And I should add that even in the Muslim world, this is the one which creates the most victims. In, in Pakistan, the blas blasphemy laws, two, two categories of blasphemy carry the death penalty, but nobody's been executed. But dozens and dozens of people have been killed after being accused. And in the West, this type of extra legal intimidation, as you get in Europe, is also a factor. Some examples of this. In 2009, Yale University Press published the definitive book on the Danish cartoon crisis by Jutta Clausen. Uh, part of the agreement with her was that they would in the book include illustrations, one of which was to be a photograph of the page of the cartoons from, from the Island Post. Not each individual cartoon, large, but just you know, one page, with, so a whole newspaper page with these things. That is, this is a book about these. Let's show them what the book is about. And there were also, so Yale um, decided not to publish that page. Um, it also decided not to publish uh, other illustrations, one of which was Gustav Doré's 19th century illustration of Muhammad in hell, uh, an illustration for Dante's Inferno. Um, so they went back on an, Yale went back on an agreement for this because they had canvassed various people um, nine or ten people um, who said it would be dangerous, too dangerous to do that. It would result in violence. So Yale preemptively censored itself and says we will not show this. And as you know at the time, most um, American newspapers did not show those cartoons um, on the grounds that uh, they wanted to protect religious feelings, um, a sentiment which has never appeared. For example, when they um, show illustrations uh, uh, illustrations which are insulting to Christianity or perhaps other religions. Or, still on the publishers, Random House at the last minute rejected the historical romance novel about Muhammad's wife Aisha, The Jewel of Medina, by American writer Sherry Jones. They said this was, quote, to protect the safety of the author and anyone else involved. Um, an English publisher was going ahead until his house was firebombed. So, more publishers self-censor them. The comedy show South Park refused to show, uh, sorry, the, the comedy channel censored one of its own programs. It has a legal right to do that, of course. That is the comedy show, cartoon show, South Park. Uh, they wished the, the episode of South Park, they've come into this a lot, to, they wanted to show an image of the Muslim prophet completely covered in a burr suit, though all you would see was a burr. They would say, Muhammad's inside here. Uh, that, was, that was taken out. They could not show it. The images of, of Buddha, of Moses, um, of Jesus were, of course, left. This was no problem. 
Um, another one, Molly Norris, a cartoonist for the Seattle Weekly, after the South Park episode, said, we should have a everybody draw Muhammad Day, you know, just to show we're not going to um, buckle under to this. Uh, after death threats, she quickly withdrew the suggestion. The FBI advised her to go into hiding. She has given up her job, changed her name, and gone into hiding. She's in the equivalent to a witness protection program for that statement in the United States of America. Um, and in 2010, Jack, Zachary Cheshire, Chesser, a young convert to Islam, pleaded guilty to threatening the creators of South Park and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Or just one more, on October 3rd, 2011, approximately 800 newspapers refused to run the non sequitur cartoon by Wiley Miller. The cartoon contained no depiction of Muhammad, but merely a bucolic scene with the caption, where's Muhammad? The Washington Post refused to cover that. Um, it's not clear whether they said because it was insulting to Muslims or uh, they were worried about safety. But usually they claim it's something to do with religious feelings. But the same media are willing to um, uh, carry insult to uh, other religions. I don't know of any newspaper or TV channel which refused to carry advertising for, say, the Da Vinci Code, a book whose premise is that Christianity is false and the church engaged in mass murder to, uh, to hide that fact. So religious sensitivity is not really the uh, reason. As British comedian Ben Elton correctly said about the BBC in a similar context, says it was too scared to allow jokes about Islam. The BBC will let you make vicar gags, but they will not let you make imam gags. They might pretend that it's you know, something to do with their moral sensibilities. It isn't. It's because they're scared. So we have this creeping danger within the United States. A another concern is relations between the current administration and the organization of Islamic cooperation, seeking to shape things, sp shape speech about things Islamic. In his 2009 Cairo speech to the Muslim world, President Obama said that he would, and I quote, fight against negative stereotypes of Islam whenever they appear. Uh, why, again, this was only of one religion, and, and why this would be understood to be the job of the chief executive of the, of the federal government was not clear. But this was taken to be you know, a policy of the US government that we will fight negative stereotypes of Islam. In July of last year, uh, Secretary of, in Istanbul, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton co-chaired with the OIC a high-level meeting on combating religious intolerance. At that meeting, co-chaired with the OIC, she invited the OIC to Washington to exchange ideas on how the US government should combat purported neg negative stereotyping of Islam. She did not explain why the administration is partnering with a religious organization which is currently aggressively lobbying to restrict freedom of speech and religion and freedom of speech and religion worldwide and many of whose members um, uh, ferociously re uh, repress dissenting religions and political views. Its members include Iran who I've mentioned, Saudi Arabia who I've mentioned, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Egypt, and others, the leading lights of this organization. Um, the OIC has sought to pressure Western governments for 20 years to restrict speech about Islam. Its very charter commits it to combat defamation of Islam, and its current action plan calls for deterrent punishments by all states to counter purported Islamophobia. They do not define each of these terms, but if we study what they do at home, it seems to be clear what sort of things they would like us to do as well. The conference that Hillary Clinton advertised while in Istanbul was held in Washington, DC, um, December 12th through 14, 2011. It was closed to the public. Presentations focused on America's deficiencies in its treatment of Muslims. 
No doubt there are such deficiencies. They stressed that the US needed to learn from other delegations there, which included Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and others. Um, Saudi Arabia, of course, headquarters, provides the headquarters for the OIC, and is a country which bans churches, represses Shiites, publishes millions of textbooks that teaches that Jews should be killed, and on the opening day of the conference, beheaded a woman for sorcery. This was one of the delegations the US said it needed to learn from on the matter of tolerance. I should stress that uh, uh, Secretary of State Clinton is emphasized in Istanbul and also in talks around this conference that she was not suggesting any sort of legal control of speech, but learning to be, simply learning to be tolerant. But if this is the case, why pick a partner whose very goal is legal restrictions? And uh, who, as its Secretary General said after this conference, was stand that the United States was standing united with the OIC on issues of speech. So two large dangers in the United States, um, uh, extra legal violence or threat of violence leading now to widespread self-censorship, and also um, government policies which are seeking to control speech about Islam. As you probably know, federal government workers, at least in the security areas, are not allowed to use certain words which some Muslims have told them are offensive to them. These words include um, words like Salafi, um, which is a fairly standard Muslim word. There are many Salafi organizations in the world, and they call themselves Salafis. So there are, in fact, names of certain organizations in Egypt which U.S. government employees are uh, not really allowed to say because some people said that word is offensive. I mean, I have, I have Muslim colleagues, none of whom have ever seemed to be offended by the use of that and, and other words. So, in conclusion, one of the main things I want to emphasize is that the effects of this debate go far beyond questions of religion narrowly understood. Um, what they mean is that governments are claiming Islamic governments and Muslim organizations are seeking to regulate religious and ideological orthodoxy. Islam shapes many of its 1.6 billion followers in matters of culture, politics, economics, science, education, personally, personal and family life, law and society, as well as what you could narrowly call religion. Hence, limits on criticism about or within Islam forcibly silence criticism and debates on matters of culture, politics, economics, science, education, and so forth. They silence criticism of dominant religious ideas and political power. Hence, to the degree that the Western world starts to fall into this pattern, certain areas of culture, family life, economics, politics, would also be off limits to um, discussion. The actress Brigitte Bardot in, in France has been uh, fined at least three times for her criticism of Muslim slaughter practices for um, halal meat. I mean, she said them in a sort of pretty pointed manner, but they were, in fact, comments about a practice um, rather than anything else. So in the Western world, there's a tendency to slide into the same sort of very broad-based uh, restrictions. As comedian Rowan Atkinson, who you might know as Mr. Bean, or I know better as Blackadder, as comedian Rowan Atkinson warns, he's been very outspoken on these matters, these restrictions produce a veneer of tolerance concealing a snake pit of unerred and unchallenged views. Norway, for example, has very stringent hate speech laws. This did not prevent Anders Behring Breivik from slaughtering over 70 people uh, because of his antipathy to Islam. Indeed, his writings suggest that he engaged in that violence because he believed he could not otherwise be heard. It was this, a horrific attention-getting device. And in the Muslim world, Radicals, again, uh, cut down debate on almost everything. 
after Salman Tazir, the Muslim governor of Punjab, the largest province in Pakistan, after he was murdered in, in January of last year for opposing the country's blasphemy law. He was killed by one of his guards who said he was a blasphemer for opposing the blasphemy law. So here you get the ratchet effect. To criticize the law is illegal under the law which you're criticizing. And indeed, if you criticize that fact, you might. So the ratchet effect goes on. Um, the Tazia's murderer was in fact convicted. But the judge who presided over the trial in which he was convicted has had to flee from Pakistan because of his cooperation. You know, seeking to punish someone who killed a blasphemer would itself be wrong. So he cannot go there. If you were to defend that judge, you may find yourself in, the, in that situation. So it comes very like a Monty Python skit, that you're not allowed to mention anymore what it is that you uh, are dissenting from. So, and as Salman Tazir's daughter observed after he was killed, and then later on the um, uh, only Christian cabinet minister in, um, in Pakistan, Shabazz Bhatti, was killed, uh, Tazir's daughter said, this is a message to every liberal in Pakistan. Shut up or be shot. Nasser Abu Zaid, a Muslim scholar driven out of Egypt by Islamists, say that blasphemy accusations in the Muslim world are key weapons in the fundamentalist arsenal to prevent the reform of Muslim societies. And they will confine the world's Muslim population to a bleak, colorless prison of socio-cultural and political conformity. Given these tendencies within the Muslim world, President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton should end US government attempts with the OIC to shape free discourse on Islam and instead clearly declare that in open, boisterous, free societies, all religions and all views are likely to be subject to credulity, criticism, contradiction, and calumny. And that the uh, OIC and many others must learn to accept and protect these. As the late Abdul Ram Wahid, the former president of Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim country, former president of Nadat al-Ulama, the world's largest Muslim organization, 40 to 50 uh, million members, uh, uh, President Wahid uh, wrote the foreword to the book Silenced. And in this he says, coercively applied blasphemy laws narrow the bounds of acceptable discourse about vast spheres of life, literature, science, and culture. Rather than encourage Muslim fundamentalists in their effort to impose a spiritually void, harsh, and monolithic understanding of Islam upon the world, Western authorities should instead firmly defend freedom of expression. When politics and religion are intertwined, as they necessarily are in debates about blasphemy and insulting Islam, then without religious debate and critique, there can be no political debate and critique. America's founders, at a time when religious differences in this country were usually far more pervasive, intrusive, volatile, and sometimes dangerous than they are now, prophetically forbade laws impeding the free exercise of religion or abridging freedom of speech or infringing the freedom of the press. Their testimony and their example is always needed but never more so than at a time such as this. Thank you very much.